Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this week's instalment of J Plus R Movie Podcasts. Uh, this week, we will be talking about the film Cloud Atlas. Well, I'll give a plot synopsis, though this time I'll be reading it off of a different source compared to how we usually kind of try and summarize. Because I don't know if I could summarize this movie in like a bunch of easily digestible sentences, but IMDb definitely can, so I'll just read that off. The reincarnation of a soul travels through time, beginning with the diary of a potential slave owner voyaging across the Pacific in 1849. Then a talented composer writing letters to his lover in the Britain's 1930s, followed by a reporter investigating a corrupt case about a U.S. nuclear power plant in the 1970s, succeeded by a publisher's comical entrapment in a nursing home in 2012, followed by a clone's thrilling escape and rebellion in 2144's Korea, and finally a tribesman fighting cannibals in a forgotten colony world past 23,000. First question, did you understand that it was a single reincarnated soul the entire time while you are watching the film? In a sense, what I understood was that whenever an actor was playing one role in one story and they reappeared in another story, that that was supposed to be the indication that that was the same soul. And I'm aware of the comet birthmark as well. I, I don't know if that's really the indication of a soul as much as it is an indication that that person has been kind of chosen for something, in a sense. I mean, I've seen various articles, like, kind of breaking it down and giving their own opinions, but but, but, but what's your opinion on that? On the comic birthmark? It, well, it, yeah, no, on, and on the reincarnation metaphor. I think, I think the reincarnation metaphor made sense. I didn't understand that it was a single soul. I thought it was a tree of ancestry making decisions and then being affected by those decisions constantly to show the cycle of how the past and the future kind of has a parasitic relationship. But it does make sense that it was one soul, I suppose. I can see it now. The, the the birthmark was supposed to be the indication of one soul, or that like the same actors playing different roles was the indication of one soul. Yeah, no, no I, yeah, I understand how that works. I just assumed it was an ancestry tree. To be fair, not that that particularly matters. I thought it was an interesting way to kind of tell a story. I think it was a much more thematic story than it was per se a tight narrative. But as kind of implied by the by the plot thing that i just gave this movie is really 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 ambitious because i can think of blockbusters that were plenty ambitious but this isn't really a blockbuster movie even though it's definitely got that scale and that scope i can't think of many other movies that were as ambitious as, as this one and honestly like by by the end of this film like my brain was kind of fried that being said i thought this movie was kind of amazing i thought this movie was incredibly incredibly impressive in a sense I can imagine this is probably what it felt like to watch like 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time. It's it's like you watch it and even if you don't really understand it, you just know that it was kind of an experience. I can absolutely see why certain people hated it when it came out, but I do think that it's one of those films that gets better the more you think about it. Well, I, found, I found the film interesting. I think each sub-story was contained quite well and they were linked by an overall theme. You know, it was all about lies that kind of get exposed and, you know, they get covered up and the way that human connections kind of helped get to a better truth, that's kind of the one thing that sort of stitched everything together, even when it ended, ended tragically. I get how it could be seen as one of those very, very confusing sequences, but I mm -hmm. found it very thematically consistent, so it wasn't difficult to follow and i think that's a crucial ingredient to a film like this if you're mm -hmm. consistent the plot doesn't actually have to make that much logical sense as you progress. okay because not that the stories didn't have their points i mean you know the fact that one guy was doing poison for the gold was set up well and that kind of thing but the connections don't have to be obvious and they don't have to make 100 percent sense the entire time there are a couple of links here and there like six myths in two stories and obviously the answers are yeah, pop up here and there to connect it and you there are occasional references to other stories. So, you, could, you know, there's a couple of more obvious connections. But for me, even without those, I think the themes would have carried it. Yeah, I agree. Because, like, even as I was watching it, because this is definitely a very disorientating film, especially in the first act. But I think as it goes on, I kind of realized that all of the stories were about liberation. Like, in every single one of these stories, you have a character who is part of society and they are going against the norm in a sense. So I'm not going to list like every example to, to give two examples of like you have the first story you have Ewing who is the main character he's kind of different because although he's definitely he's not part of the slavery abolition movement but, but you can tell that he doesn't like slavery you can tell that he's against it and you and through that friendship that he has with that slave who's the stowaway aboard the ship you see how like 
he he is becoming kind of liberated. He's be- he's going against the what society dictated at the time. And then you have the Frobisher story, which is the one that takes place afterwards, and he's he's kind of going against society as well because although he wants to be remembered as a great composer, he's also you know he's also bisexual and he doesn't want that exposed, you know, but. At the same time, he's also doing everything that he can to become, you know, a figure of history. But then, you know, history has a bit more of a tragic outcome. It definitely has the most tragic ending of any of them. I and killing himself. A bit, actually. Because obviously you've got the story in the more futuristic landscape before the fall happened. Her cry for help in her time meant nothing. And it didn't really mean that much for a long time going for, going on the last story. So actually, it, there was something, something happened. It wasn't. As, as, as quick as the rebellion wanted it to be. Just, and I was, and I was yeah. making the point that the composer's mm-hmm. track got out a mere 40 years after he died, while, while you know, the payoff for the rebellion in that future society was clearly quite a lot longer. It might have taken centuries, you know, for Somni to be worshipped as, like, a, you know, a goddess, essentially. I, I think it's just it's just that fact of the fact that, like, in the process, you know, although, although, yeah, Somni still got captured and died at the end, and, you know, the man that she was in love with died too. It was tragic, but there was definitely still more of a, like, victory in that tragedy, whereas it, the the Frobisher story, it's like, okay, he does make that great bit of music, but he doesn't become a great composer, and, you know, he ends up, up choosing to kill himself, you know, for a variety of reasons, and he ends up leaving his, his boyfriend heartbroken. I mean, his boyfriend finds another person, but you know, you can kind of tell that he, the, the the old six myth is kind of is probably still grieving, you know, about it. And even the old six myth gets like killed as well. I, I'm I just think maybe labeling it the most tragic is perhaps. No, I can see that. Mentioning that future story, actually, I do love the fact that you get a Soylent Green reference before the reveal. It was an example of blending tones, because that bit when he was yelling out Soylent Green is people, when in the uh, 2012 storyline where you have Timothy Cavendish who's put in the nursing home wrongfully, and then for a scheme, and kind of, it was kind of his own fault, but anyway, so 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 when he's like walking out and he yells out to the people from outside, oh, Soylent Green is people, Soylent Green is people, and he's doing it as a joke, and it's kind of a funny reference. But then that reference is played straight later on, so it's kind of like, oh, okay, that's no, it's not so funny. For me, that is one of the best examples of setup I have ever seen. It it sets it up and primes your brain for it without you even being aware of it until it comes up again. You're like, hang on a minute, because they're not too close together, so you're not still thinking about that scene, and and you know, it's not it's not like a very plot relevant line so you could easily forget it but then when that comes up you do kind of remember it oh oh yeah they referenced it given the nature of the story the film has a lot of that it's a necessary part that this generation spanning connected storylines like stuff that you're telling it's it's obvious that you're going to have a lot of links but that is definitely one of the more unique and maybe one of the more meta links i just think it was one of the better links done because it, it primed mm. you so unconsciously for it and it didn't feel at all out of place in the scene that it was in, which is what I can find sometimes a bit problematic about certain kinds of links in in films like this. Nice to just get that subtlety to it. It was just really that was just really great writing. The entire film, what it kind of felt like that there was this subtle sort of commentary on media as well, because a lot of the things that happened in the film in these different stories were later published as forms of media. The Adam Ewing story, the first one. That kind of gets published as like a diary. And Frobisher does the Cloud Atlas Sextet, which is the piano theme that you hear throughout the film. Then in the 70s, the Louisa Ray, the reporter storyline, that, that, that gets published as like an expose. Then in the 2012 story, the Timothy Cavendish one, that gets made into a movie. And then in the Somni story, that recording that she does at the end then comes back as, as a message in the last storyline. It's one that they're listening to. Yes, yeah, I mean, they're all references, bits of media. I think it's a, a way that just keeps the connections alive and helps kind of bridge everything together. And B, it shows that every story of liberation inspires the next story of liberation that inspires the next one that inspires the next one. The fact that it was told at the end by a pretty much completely liberated society. They weren't even on Earth anymore, you know, they, they, they were on some other planet. It was a nice touch as well to begin and end with old Zachary. So Zachary is the protagonist of the last story. It was quite cool to see... Like, the very first shot of the film is stars, and then it pans down, and then you see old Zachary. It's almost like he's recounting the events of the film to people, and that's kind of, I think, the intention. 
that it does seem like that that that's what he's doing like obviously he's recounting his own story but he could be also recounting all of these other stories as well especially on like you know a society that's gone away from earth and that has like limitless sci-fi information or whatever you can probably buy that they would know about all of these things it, it was definitely a bit like disorientating as i said um, especially to begin with because the way that the film opens again it does open it does have that opening with like old zachary and then it transitions and it does this sort of montage. So the Louisa Ray story, I think you're seeing the middle of that. And as for the other stories, I can see this being confusing for certain people. Certain stories, they begin at the end, like the Frobisher story, that's the end of the story, but it begins right there. The same for the Timothy Cavendish story, uh, the same for the Somni story, as and even technically the same for the Zachary story. Like I think the first story which is quite a neat touch. It, the first story is the only one that I think starts at the beginning. Yeah, I think it is the only one that starts at the dead beginning. You know, the, you know, the old Zachary story is just him narrating by the campfire. That's all it is. It's almost like the, each story is him telling this story to the children. You can almost imagine him telling these stories in all these different voices to entertain the children. Well, at the same time, these stories feel complete and on their own of the completely appropriate time. I think it works. It keeps the interesting sections the more actiony sections and the development sections of each story at the same point at each time. On another point of the structure as well, like you've got that opening montage and it cuts to the titles. And then we begin and we get these fairly long setup sequences that kind of establish what's going on. And then the rest of the film is essentially cross cut. Not, not all of these stories feel like they get the same amount of screen time, but that's just because more happens in some of them compared to other ones. The more action-y ones are cut together, like the more action-y ones are intercut with each other, and that helps, that's, that, that, that's very useful. But what's also kind of good as well is that in cutting between them, although it can feel a bit random, it engages your brain to just be, to kind of keep up with it, you know, and to, to try and follow these stories, and also to remember each of them like at no point during any of the stories did i outright forget about any of them like i was all they, they were always on my mind like when it was on one story i was thinking oh what about the other story are we gonna go back to that you know and then we like, go back it, to know, it. it's i think it's the perfect example of a film that multitasks you know it keeps everything fresh in your head but then you aren't it doesn't stop you being able to focus on each story when it's playing and i think that's a really something about the structure that really really works because they cut they cut things together based on, you know, occasionally it's based on rhythm and or, you know, kind of what's happening. So action or intrigue. These connections, you know, sometimes there'll be a connection and then that will trigger like flashing back to one story, you know. And then the same mood is continually carried through, keeps you engaged. Uh, I thought the editing in this movie was amazing. I mean, like, I can't imagine editing this movie. Like having to, it, it's like, imagine having to cut together six stories like this, because it's a long movie, yeah. but imagine having to cut it in a way that somehow keeps the audience's attention, you know, and doesn't make them get completely lost. It's not necessarily a slow paced film, but it is a film that uh, like, you do feel the length of it. Like I, I definitely did feel the length whilst I was watching it. I never felt like the film dragged. I never felt like any scene dragged. It's meticulous but engaging is the way I'd put it. It's pacing. Uh -huh. That, that, that would be the terminology I would use, I think. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it takes its time, it makes sure everything's set up, it makes sure you know what's going on, but it always has something ha happen. And I think that's sometimes the trap of films that try and do something like this that don't work, is that they don't always have an event in each story happen with each cut between them, which mm -hmm. these ones kind of do. So, you know, like you get the meeting of um, Sixsmith and then they don't try and go further with that. They go, no, that's the interesting point, let's move on. And then mm -hmm. they've got, then they'll take you into, I can't remember what the cut was after that, actually, but um, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll cut you into another story. And then, you know, something significant will happen. And then you'll drop into another one. Because it keeps that significance up, punctuated that entire time. Everything feels significant, so it can't drag because nothing feels like, we don't need to know this, or, oh, this is mm -hmm. a bit more than we need, or, oh, we kind of already realised that because it doesn't give you enough time in each story to do that. Feel it, set up its, mm -hmm. its next moment. And then move on. Yeah, and that's pretty hard as well because these stories are fun. They are thematically connected, but they are very, very different stories. Yeah, um, they are. that kind of thing is very to like establish. At the same time, like yeah, I, I think the editing just helps. Like it just it helps, and it also helps as well that like stories that are a bit more grounded don't get quite as much focus. Like during the film, I felt like the 
the Somni story was the one that got maybe the most screen time because that felt like the most action heavy one. They, they they devote a lot of time to uh, the stories that are the most engaging. I can also all of the stories like are very very different in genre as well. Yes, at the same time, the only one that you could argue is a bit out of place is the Timothy Cavendish story because that section of the film is just straight up comedy despite being very different it's still easy to see how this storyline comedic and even arguably small and insignificant as it may be is still vitally important well i think it's got two major effects that help it a you know it conforms to the theme just point, it points out the ridiculousness of, of its structure which is kind of an interesting thing to do because a lot of the structures in the film when you look down at them are kind of ridiculous you know and they, and, and it's almost the point the film makes you know you should liberate yourselves from structures that don't make sense to you because they probably don't it's comparing this stuff with like slavery your attitudes against homosexuality or even like a corrupt dystopian regime you know it's like uh, but it doesn't really feel out of place it's somewhat of a redemption story for timothy yeah because he starts out very very selfish and greedy and it's shown in a bit of a small way but in that sequence where they're escaping he could have easily left that fourth old guy behind, but he doesn't. He goes to go back for him. And that one act of selflessness helps him out in the bar because that guy then stands up and does that hilarious, oh, like, oh, Scotsman. Yeah. yeah, he does that Scotsman thing. And that and that gets all of the bar members to fight back, fight against the nursing home people that come in. And then at the end of it, he kind of gets rewarded as well. He gets to go back to, you know, his, his like... That Long for, lost for, for love. Yeah, I think his soul got rewarded because of that. Like in the Neo Soul story, you see like him just it, it, in a crowd, just as a random person. And he's and I think he's playing the Cloud Atlas theme as well, an instrument. I think. Yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah. Um. So arguably, he gets to get what he was kind of denied in the Frobisher story because Jim Broadbent also plays Vivian A as the main like composer guy who Frobisher is kind of out with, and and Frobisher kind of essentially like creates that music it creates the cloud atlas music but then yeah this 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 future soul gets to kind of play it so and then at the end of it you see jim broadbent he's, he's among one of the several like advanced humans i think who is essentially bringing humanity to a different planet you watch the credits where it showed like who each actor was playing i did yeah there were there were a couple of surprises in there i have to say yeah, me too. And, and and I saw that credits bit as well, but even watching the film, I was like, oh, holy shit, that guy, that person played that person? I thought it was somebody else, you know? Yeah, exactly. There were a lot of them, like, uh, Halle Berry was playing one of the medical doctors. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. sometimes I could tell there was something off about a couple of the nursing staff, and then it was like, oh, it's Hugo Weaving. What the film does is to show the continuity of souls, it kind of, they, they, they have the same actor playing different roles. Sometimes they're the lead in one segment sometimes they're just seen in a photo in another so it's very varying like you know so like sometimes there'll be a supporting role sometimes there'll just be a cameo sometimes they'll be the lead in terms of the actors who will get to play lead roles tom hanks is the lead in the final story jim sturgess is the lead in the first story ben weisher is the lead in the second story Halle Berry is the lead in the third story. Jim Broadbent is the lead in the fourth story. Duna Bay, she's the lead in the Somni story. So, so, so they're all the leads, but they also appear in other roles throughout the film. I think, especially on a rewatch, it's it's interesting to watch where everyone gets. They kind of weirdly all have character arcs, even though they're they're not the same individual. But since they are this, you get the sense that they are the same soul. That there is a development going across. So, to give you an example, like Tom Hanks, the main one. In the first story, he's the villain. You know, he's he is essentially the villain of the first story. Yeah, he is. But then in the final story, he's the hero. And then you see that sort of progression throughout the various other stories. Like, you know, in, in the second story, he's just a random hotel owner, I guess. And then in the third story, and, and we'll touch upon this in a moment, but in the third story, he's the author who makes timothy cavendish like a success and then in the louisa ray story he's like the the mole in this company you know the one who leaks out stuff to and assists louisa and i think that that is what then sets forth not only him being the guy who was playing timothy cavendish in that film based on the events of the 2012 story but then him being that that final hero who gets the chance to move on, you know, and then uh, you know essentially become this like storyteller. Um, you ha so you have that main arc, 
but you have a lot of different other arcs as well. I mean, what what ones did you pick up on? I liked that Halle Berry's character kind of, you know, she moved up from being a slave in, into becoming the liberator and becoming, mm-hmm. the, she moved from being the liberator to the liberator and she kind of mm-hmm. got, her character got to be the, one, the wisest and the smartest character by the mm-hmm. end. Yeah, I found that I found that really, really compelling to watch. I felt I thought mm-hmm. that really great at the end. Hugo Weaving's character didn't really de- develop as such. He just kind of got. I, 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 I would say he got worse. Yeah, yeah, he did get worse. Yeah, like cause... Was almost, almost like a negative character arc, which I loved because mm-hmm. you don't just get to see them very much. It, I mean, it's hard to say he starts out as because you only see Hugo Weaving at the end um, in the first story. Can tell us in... a comfortable life. That's that's kind of how he lives. Yeah, yeah, but you know that he's like a yeah, you know he deals it's in slavery, so you know that he's the bad guy. But then, but you see him get worse, like businessman who deals in slavery. Then he's a German who's implied to be like a Nazi. And then we see him as like a psych- psychotic racist hitman, and then you know we kind of see him like as as the the female nurse in the timothy cavendish story and then he's and we see him in the korean story and he's where he's like i think he's the main guy who is like capturing somebody yeah or something. He is. he's the one that's kind of making sure she gets executed keeps the corruption going. and then in the final story he's the devil basically yeah pretty much yeah i i think he honestly i think he was the devil all along i think that that was just his final form you know his final true form he's not called the devil he's called old georgie he's the devil for uh the culture that shows up in zachary's time and he plays that role really, really well. Like I love the I love the shot where he's just walking along on the mountain. I was watching that and I was like, that that's pretty damn idiosyncratic. You're not gonna like like how often is it that you see a such a weird visual like that, you know? And it for yeah. but it went along with the tone of the rest of the story because that story was definitely the weirdest, and that's just because of the language. The language, the the really bizarre language. The language that they really speak dissolved, in. and it was. It was also just, I think it was probably the most, like, internally psychological story, because all of it really depended on uh, Zachary's mind, which was falling apart from what was implied to be pollution from the land poison because the oil industry fucked up the nuclear industry. And get that, I got it more as just like, you know, the devil was playing upon just what was going on, you know. You know I'd assumed it was the poison simply to his mind, because I said it upright at the start, with obviously, because um, the, the villain, the, the villainous character he was playing was poisoning the... Um, the um, oh, okay. Oh, I get it. It, old, it was poisoning uh, uh, Ewing, yeah. I heard about ground poisoning, and I thought that back to the oil in the third story with how those were Oh, oh, because obviously there's a kind of underlying theme of like climate change and pollution and all that kind of thing, and how that wreaks havoc on society. And then it moves into, you know, obviously when it gets there, I thought, oh, I guess the poison that's killing his daughter might be making him hallucinate. I mean, it makes sense. They're all going to die eventually anyway, and clearly his mind is just breaking. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the, 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 there is a reason why they left. Uh, I don't remember picking up on why they left Earth. I thought it was just because they had evolved and that they just moved to other colonies or something. I don't think it's ever directly stated, but I'd assumed it was climate change because there was, you know, there was a whole thing about um, the whole of uh, the upper upper seal. They'd already had to go up, and that was about to go underwater as well because you know, so sea sea tide rising levels. So they didn't. Everything became more mechanized because there was no temperature control and things like that. So for me, I kind of just went and started going, okay. I guess this is what's happening. So I might be wrong, but that's just the way mm-hmm. that I, read the, I read the film. It is sort of the subtle thread that you could argue, or maybe a hint as to like what's going on with the world, you know. The Zachary story, I did, I think that that was also helped because I did have the subtitles. So therefore I knew, I mean, I could understand the language fine, but it also just helped that I could read it as well. If I didn't have subtitles, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd know as well. I think I'd have to think about what they were saying, but. I didn't have to. Performances all around were really impressive. What what I quite loved as well is that each actor kind of got the chance to explore a different kind of character, even though, like, obviously people like Hugo Weaving play a villain in all of them. You still get that, like, none of these characters are the same, basically. Yeah, none of, and... them, are individu- none of them are, as individuals, are the same. Collectively, mm-hmm. you understand that they are, but as individuals, mm-hmm. they're... They're very, very different places in life. Very, very different people. And they walk different. They talk different. They, you know, and you kind of, and it gives it, you know, it, you can tell the actors were having a blast because they got they just got to play with so much. The standout for me was Jim Broadbent. I thought that Jim Broadbent was gave probably the best performances of his career. You know, I know him as often playing, you know, these kind of like kindly mentor figures. In the first three stories, mainly is where he gets screen time. So I just loved how. How much he he dug into his roles so much, but he made them all his own. 
You know, he made like in the first story where he's playing that racist captain. Then in the second story where he's playing just a like Vivian Ayers, who's just a real douchebag, you know, a real like controlling asshole. But then you see him really let loose as Timothy Cavendish and play this like, you know, again, selfish guy, but a really likable dude. He played all of those roles really excellently. I'd say this about every single action character. You always hated them when you needed to and loved them when you needed to. And it, 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 mm-hmm. it didn't get conflicted loyalties from across. For me, that would that's an achievement. And I could say that for all the cast. Like, you know, like Hugh Grant has probably the smallest role, but I love how he always plays a villain in each of them as well. Yeah. Like similar to you go weaving. But the difference is that he never like becomes bigger than he is in all of them. I, I mean he's a bit he's bigger at the end because at the end he's He's playing this cannibal tribesman who is responsible yeah. for killing some, you know, somebody in Zachary's past. But he never really, he doesn't really increase in the same way that Hugo Weaving increases. But I did love how, like, in his brief scenes, you can tell he really was just like, I'm, I'm not playing a, you know, romantic lead in a movie, so I'm just gonna have fun with like well, these I roles think I'm what having. Really impressed me about Hugh Grant in that film is that half the time he was the one that I noticed the least. When I saw the cannibal guy, I was like, that's Hugh Grant. That- caught me off guard There's a couple roles that i didn't i didn't clock that it was hugh grant i just thought that was amazing i think Hugh yeah. Grant is a fantastic actor and very very versatile but you only yeah, what he's typecast at so i think this this you know in this in this film i think this film is a perfect showcase of his talent and versatility because it's just completely by all of his performances you, you know you're able to invest in them believe in them same goes for other actors as well like i think the prime one is maybe tom hanks as well because hanks like as great of an actor as he is i do think that he has a tendency to play very very similar roles like i always see him as the good the good guy in power who has to save people essentially that's that that, that's a lot of the roles that you play often it's not every role but it's definitely a lot of roles in this one i thought you got a chance to kind of uh, like do something different like even when he's playing the hero he's not really like he's definitely a guy who loses a lot but he does eventually win at the end when he gets to in that final battle that you get he gets to make up for it he gets his own redemption arc in that story as well yeah 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 his soul gets the redemption as well of like you know because again he's in the first story again surprisingly he is actually the villain and it's not it's not atrocious villain as well like cruel long game there that was a real shock to see tom hankton i found that villain probably the one that i was probably the most uncomfortable about the the cocktail of the absolute betrayal (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know, like, he's supposed to be healing him, but he's poisoning you, you know, and that's, and that is pretty terrible. Yeah, when he clocks Tom Hanks, your brain just goes, but, but it's Tom Hanks. Yeah, 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 he, like, like, normally in a film like this, he'd be, you know, the, the Ewan character, he'd be, he'd be a hero, but no, in this one, he's he, No, he'd, be, he'd probably be a, a less racist version of the sea captain. You know, that's probably, like, yeah. That's thing you expect Tom Hanks to do, ups the sense of betrayal, because he's not just betraying the character, Tom Hanks is betraying you as a viewer yeah. because you know what his star image is i just think that was I think, yeah. I think that's a pitch perfect use of casting there the, the the bit when he appears in the 2012 story i i think that might be my 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 favorite tom hanks scene of all time i think not his best acting of all time but probably the funniest because him turning up as a like london gangster was just <laughs> it was just hilarious honestly like that sequence yeah. was awesome you, you pulled it off well you just kind of sit there look at it, you're just like I, okay yeah, I know. I, I know it's the weirdest bit of casting ever, but it's like it's so know. entertaining, though. I yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, so the sequence itself is the first time you see Timothy Cavendish. It's the bit where like he's you know he's a book publisher, and then Hanks is playing this like fuckish London gangster guy who then just comes in. He's all like, "I, I want people to buy me book. I want people to buy me book." He's pissed off because there's this one critic of the party who reviewed his book poorly and resulted in it not getting bought. You know, and then at the end. And then at the end of the scene, he basically takes the critic and just throws him off the roof. You know, it's like <laughs> people buy the book as a result of the controversy. And 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 speaking of controversy, that some people didn't like that scene because they thought that uh, the Wachowskis and Tom Twyker, it felt like it was like literally meant to be an attack on critics. But I don't think it was. Well, no, I don't think it was. It's just I think it just sets sets up the story well. And I think it, I think it, don't go wrong. I I have no doubt that it about vent some frustration some frustration at critics like you always do as a maker of, of anything if you get a bad review purely because you don't like getting bad reviews like you know i think i think they were perhaps having a little bit of fun with that it's played sun and tongue in cheek it's done for the development of the initial conflict in the story 
Mm-hmm. Nothing really good comes from killing the critic either. He does become successful, but that doesn't necessarily help Timothy in the long run. You know, it's he, like he still has to go to his brother to pay off Irish thugs. You know? Also, I mean, th- there are plenty of critics who liked Cloud Atlas. You know, so so clearly, and, and we both like it. You know, and that, I mean, we're not professional critics, but we both like it. So so I'm not so 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 no so no so I wasn't even remotely bothered by that i was i wasn't bothered by timothy's line where he says like you know what is a critic but one that reads quickly arrogantly but never wisely because honestly in that sequence i i, I think timothy was just trying to appeal to the dermot guy the guy that he was trying to appeal to you know to his, to his client and b i also got the, so got the idea that timothy's a bit of a, a failure of a publisher really I mean, that's not a hard book. That wouldn't be the hardest book to sell, even with a bad review on a cult market. Mm-hmm. I mean, the character has an inflated sense of self-importance, and we know he mm-hmm. didn't get like loads of debt. Yeah, he is very selfish, you know, as you can as you can see in the yeah. In but the I think like, was never actually that successful. So him mm-hmm. doing critics critics like that is him just selfishly make, having a pop for his own self satisfaction. I also just don't think he cares either way, because all because he's just a publisher. He just wants his book to be successful you know he's kind of he, he's almost like you know a guy who works for a studio it's like people at studios don't really care if their movie is like oh, um, just brilliant. I just want the money. You know, it kind of helps for a film that is this philosophical as well it kind of helps to kind of say like don't take us too seriously you know like like we are having fun and that kind of off because with films like that we've talked about before like serenity and collateral beauty a big problem with them is that they don't have a sense of humor or they don't have a sense of like we kind of know this is a bit outlandish but i feel like this film does yeah, even oh, in its more serious absolutely moments. knows i think that's why they've got the timothy cameron story in there as well to make mm-hmm. you know because it, it sets up that comedy tone a little bit and there's just details in each story that you just you do just sit there and you go hang on <laughs> and mm-hmm. the film doesn't shy away from that it kind of just let you see how absurd it is at times and it leans into it like i think the entire second language actually has like elements of comedic rhythm in it and i think that's intentional because it shows that we don't know any better than you do how this is going to go but we thought this would be an entertaining way to take it so here you go to me it just kind of adds to the whole like weird feeling of that story compared to the, the compared to the other stories which you can more easily understand like just on a straightforward level you know the, like that one is definitely one way you have to pay attention otherwise you're not gonna understand what's going on if there is one flaw i i don't always think that the makeup is successful in terms of transforming right. these people because sometimes and this isn't all the time a lot like it, it definitely varies that there is a lot of makeup that is absolutely seamless you know there's a lot of makeup that's like amazing uh but there is some makeup that does go into the uncanny valley that does look weird they thankfully certain ones that are weaker they don't focus on as much in fact i noticed that all of the major stories the characters in them the main characters of each of the main stories it was just the actor without anything major done to them at all i mean apart from like i mean tom hanks has that um the thing across his face other than that, that it's all them normal, but then when they reappear in different stories, they're under like hair or they're aged or they're made to look younger or something like that. I think it makes up for a couple of the, couple of the aging mistakes here and there, which Halle Berry at the end looked like Halle Berry and you just stuck some makeup on her because that's just what it looked like. Uh, but I think yeah. you, uh, no, that's not enough on a performance at all, I just think. I, I couldn't necessarily name exactly. If I looked at the credits again, I could probably pick out what ones were most distracting for me. Mm. But yeah, and, and to touch on as well, a bit of the controversy as well that did come out, and that, I, I can see why, it didn't bother me, but I can see why. Some some of the race changing, in particular when, when they were doing the Korea story, because obviously there are certain actors who are not Korean, but they have makeup to make them look like that. That, yeah. that, that. that didn't bother me, because for the most part, I thought that the makeup was pretty good there, because the, ch- the changing was quite convincing, but... I, I will admit, like, if I were making this movie, I wouldn't have done that, you know? I, I, I would have just been like, okay, whatever. If I'm, if we're going to reuse actors, let's not have them play people who are, like, Asian, obviously. Like, like, like let's not, like, do yellow face or anything like that. Yeah, it, it should have been maybe written a bit more around because, or they should have, yeah, I think some of the writing, maybe, if they were going to reuse actors, they should have maybe had some last minute acknowledgements of certain things. I think it's a, fine line to walk because you don't you know because obviously there is a lot of the harmful legacy to that so i think yeah so ideas of like yellow face and stuff and i get at the very least while like uh, uh hugo weaving appears 
you know, in the career story because again, he does have to he does kind of have to be a villainous part of that system. And even uh Keith David, who's in the film, he plays in both the Louisa Ray story and the career story, he plays a guy who was part of some kind of rebellion, essentially. So I un I understand that, but you know, I probably wouldn't have I I would have just said like oh, okay, it's a white guy or something, or it's a black guy or something, not like, you know, an Asian person or whatever. It was a, it was a little bit uncomfortable, but I understand I understand why it was there, but it was uncomfortable, and I get why it got the, the criticism. <laughs> yeah. I think if the sequence of the future had perhaps been rewritten a little bit with just to have it be, you know, a, a, a colony of the last, you know, of, of the humans that had, had managed to escape the kind of thing, you could have then had, you could have avoided the problem entirely. And yeah, I loved how each of the stories, and this is on the filmmaking, I loved how, like, I could not tell that there were two cinematographers for this film. No, I didn't really notice either, because it was very, cons like, Doug, while each story had differences, they were shot in quite a similar way, it was nice and consistent, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't see any downgrade in the way lighting was used or anything like that. It's visually consistent, but also it's not like the direction kind of changes. I mean, so the Wachowskis directed the first story and the final two stories, and Tom Twyker directed the three stories in between. And Twyker's stories were definitely gr the, the most grounded ones, the most grounded in reality. And the Wachowskis, they're... Fantastical stories. So you could tell it based on that, but it was quite a beautiful uh, cycle of collaboration. I think it was a really well-directed film because you've got... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt the mood was consistent throughout. Yeah, the, yeah, the Wachowski sisters and Thomas Wyke have really, they almost developed a collaborative style and stuck to it. And it really mm -hmm. worked. You know, the actors didn't feel like they were giving any more, they were being directed to give any more or less than they usually would. Mm -hmm. The time stayed absolutely consistent. Which is hard as well, because none of these stories are tonally the same, but they all felt like they had the same tone. They're not generically the same, but message, theme, and tone stay the same. So they felt. While you got different notes to the experience, you never got a different base experience. For that, I think it's a commendable achievement of collaboration in the film. Get this stuff in like anthology movies, but this isn't really a traditional anthology film. It's harder as well, because again, you're cutting between stuff that di di like different directors' films, you know, but again, they all feel like the same. Also, I thought the final hour of this film was just amazing as well. I thought like, because the film definitely, it was, again, it was a bit disorientating and maybe a little bit slow to begin with, but once you know you got the climaxes of each story and the way that they blended together i just like i was i was pretty blown away by how this film concluded like it got very emotional as well there was definitely a lot of emotion to the story like that montage that prohibition was narrating where you see the connections between various human beings and then and then later on you get some individual emotional scenes as well like when yeah yeah you know when frobisher kills himself you know you get, you get the scene of six smith coming in and like sobbing and holding his dead body and yeah i mean you know it's coming but it's still a sad moment and it still hits you really hard yeah and that fight and that final montage was just amazingly beautiful you know when they were showing like you know like cavendish at his home reunited with susan Strandon, you know his like former girlfriend uh when you're seeing like you know you know that somebody's getting executed but thankfully you but she still died for a good cause and to cut that final confrontation in the first story where ewing is telling uh hugo weaving who's the father of his wife it's a bit like basically just to fuck off and saying no i'm gonna join the abolition movement i'm gonna move away and then then they have that final like i mean like th this film really has two amazingly powerful cappers and that's the first one is this like exchange where he, hugo weaving says like oh you know you you you'll, you'll just be a drop in the ocean you know you won't change anything yeah. the quote is like what is an ocean but a multitude of drops you know and it's like and that kind of speaks to the whole film it's like you know yeah you might you might just be one drop but you're part of a billion others you know and it's all and you know like, so, in your lifetime but it might six down the line it's all about connection as well you know it's like a multitude of drops you know they're all connected and every final scene it seems it brings us back to old zachary and it was perfect visually because not only did it get it was it was the end of him telling that story you, you know he pointed up to the sky and then he walked in and that was that that amazing final shot where it just pans up to the sky like it did to begin with you see like a comet go by as well which kind of speaks to the whole comet the birthmark angle yeah. uh, but i just thought that was an amazingly beautiful it was a perfect full circle ending 
but also yeah. just a very beautiful ending. It was kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like no matter what happens, the cycle of life continues, you know. And I think the emotion that ended on was just the connection between two people. And for yeah, that, yeah. for me, that was a wonderfully understated ending to a lot of the grand designs that happened. And it just really felt like almost the film had gone off into the sunset and had its retirement. It's not like a big ending, but it's definitely... And, you know, you could argue that maybe a film of this length should have ended grander, but I kind of love it because, you know, again, it was it was perfect. It brought the film full circle, in my opinion, and it had kind of liberation angle as well. I think the, the beauty of the film, it, it also speaks to, like, its truth in regards to, like, you know, how uh, Andy Wachowski transitioned to uh, uh, Lily Wachowski several years after this film. But formerly uh, Larry Wachowski, the transition period, I think, around the time that this film was being made. And then uh, she came out publicly... I think I think she came out publicly for the first time in 2012 when the film was getting released. So there's that kind of beautiful element of subtext about the whole liberation angle because you can tell that this was probably very personal for Lana because she was, you know, she was formerly a man and she probably felt like, you know, like any of the protagonists in this film, like not satisfied with like what society is telling me I am. You know, I don't feel like how how I am. I want to change. And then she, you know, and then she like, like made, made the transition to becoming a woman, you know? And I think that that has a, that that's kind of a beautiful, like it's a bit of a meta textual element to the film. Oh, I noticed one meta element as well. And th this might've just been unintentional, but when Hugo Weaving was playing old Georgie, uh, I, I felt like he was using his agent Smith voice again. It sounded very Agent Smith esque. Did, did yeah, you? It kind of had that hypnotic quality to it. Yeah, I, I, I see that. I, I can see that. I got giddy about seeing the Agent Smith voice as well. You know, about hearing the kind of Agent Smith esque voice that he was doing because you know I have a bit of a nostalgia for the Matrix movies. But on, but yeah, but so, so on a final note, honestly, this might be. It, it's not the best thing that the Wachowskis have been a part of, but I think this might be my favorite, maybe. I think it's their, their their finest achievement, probably again, even more so than the Matrix, because the Matrix had a, a straightforward story at least. But this is just, you know, it's the opposite of straightforward. So it's the sisters; it's it's their biggest accomplishment. A I, wonderful achievement, I think, of storytelling. I think that gets to push film a little bit. It's one of those films. In terms of the Wachowskis, in terms of their films, I've I've seen I haven't seen any of Tom Twyker's films, but I've seen a lot of the Wachowskis' films and. I think all of them are special, you know, even if even if you don't like some of them, you know, you have to admit that they're not like phoned in cash grabs or anything like they are truly artistic. You know, there is an artistic merit to them, even even yeah. to like Speed Racer, you know, I think that they are damn good directors, even though, you know, they, they might they might never top the Matrix. I think this does kind of top the Matrix in terms of ambition. In terms of quality, they might never top the Matrix, but I think that everything they've made is special. And I think I think they're just directors who are always worth a watch, even if they make something you don't particularly like. You, it's they always make something you can appreciate, and that's one thing I like about the Wachowskis. I've had problems with like Matrix Revolutions over the years, but I kind of, but I but I have come, I've I've definitely come around to it a lot more. I think that it is a very like ambitious and worthy conclusion to that trilogy that they were doing. I even I even appreciate the philosophical stuff and like you know matrix reloaded when previously i just appreciated like the action side of things my like uh, bound is a really good movie uh even uh speed racer you know definitely is more like cartoonish but even that does have some cool things that you can analyze yeah i, th I, I think jupiter ascending is maybe the only one of their films that is kind of bad but you know it's at least interestingly bad you know and i've seen sense eight as well i've seen a lot of that series that a lot of that series is quite good I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm looking forward to Matrix 4 next year, just because I know that whatever the case may be, it'll, it probably won't be... I, I mean, I have no clue how it will turn out, but I don't. I seriously doubt that it will just be a nostalgia best, like, soulless sequel or anything. I'm definitely excited for it, because I think uh, there's going to be a... There's going to be... A, you know, if they're coming, if they're coming back to the Matrix, there's something that they've not finished that... Mm -hmm. that Really good. I yeah, think. I mean, it's it, it's only Lana Wachowski who's who's coming back. It's not a a, a, a Lily Wachowski, but oh, yeah, oh, well, you know, even 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 if it's just Lana, I think she wouldn't return to it unless it was something that was you know there was something that she had left to tell in that yeah. in, in that place. Yeah. So 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 overall, I think Cloud Atlas is something that I would recommend to to mm -hmm. watch. Uh, it's a very very good film. Just don't go into it expecting a traditionally 
I'd say structured uh, film. Definitely a film where, again, I could if if you hated it, I I could understand why that you have to keep up with. But I think that it's a film that if you stick with it, and then you get to the ending, I think that once it's over, you'll probably appreciate it maybe i I can't speak for everybody i love this movie uh jack likes it too next episode we will be discussing what is it that we've decided upon jack we will be discussing akira kurosawa's yojimbo and sergio leone's a fistful of dollars